This week, it's Security Weekly Virtual Hacker Summer Camp Edition of Paul's Security Weekly. And I really hope that I get to say Security Weekly Virtual Hacker Summer Camp a lot less because it's a mouthful. In our first segment, we welcome Chad Anderson, Senior Security Researcher at Domain Tools, to discuss observing disinformation campaigns. In our second segment, it's the Security Weekly News, talking about how hackers could spy on satellite internet traffic with just $300 of home TV equipment. Smart locks opened with no more than a MAC address. The 17-year-old mastermind and two others behind the biggest Twitter hack uh, are arrested. Flaw and popular Node.js Express file upload module allows for denial of service attacks. And why Netgear won't patch 45 router models because uh, they are vulnerable to a serious flaw. But guess what? No patch for those. In our final segment, we air a pre-recorded interview with Sumed Dakar, the president and chief product officer at Qualys, and Mayhal Ravankar, the VP of Product Management and Engineering of VMDR at Qualys, discussing automating your vulnerability management program. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Hackers attack systems that are not patched. You need protection, but virtual patching isn't working. That's why you go patchless. Topia analyzes, prioritizes, and remediates vulnerabilities before they're exploited. Even the zero days, all from one interface. Security gets better memory defense to complement endpoint strategy while improving overall vulnerability management and compliance. Adopt a hacker's mindset, eliminate vulnerability. Get your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash vicarious. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is flat networks inside the cloud and data center that allow threats to move laterally and compromise vulnerable targets. But micro-segmentation using traditional firewalls is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach, Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation. Using the identity of machines and software that are communicating, Edgewise offers the strongest protection that adapts automatically to changes. Protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network by visiting Security Week weekly.com forward slash edgewise and welcome to the show but first let me introduce you to a man who always enjoys a big mouthful of barbecue mr paul acidorian welcome to paul security weekly it's episode 661 being recorded on august 6th 2020 right here in g unit studios in rhode island to my left mr matt alderman is here in studio six months it took me six months to get back here that's right it's nice to you. Uh, to, you didn't drive here either. You flew. No, I, I had to fly. That's what I'm saying, Larry. I, I don't know how you're quarantined, but I'm not quarantined. I just, I guess, I came in another entrance and didn't get flagged. I, I'm not gonna make comments about coming in entrances or the wrong ones or <laughs> like. Nope. I think he, I think he came in the back. <laughs> and I was wondering a, why his arms were tired. Is there a wrong one? Anyway, <laughs> on the lines remotely, Mr. Joff Thayer is here with us. Joff, welcome. Good evening. It is great to be back. Uh, has it been a while? Feels like it's been a while. Anyway, it's good to be here. Again. It's been so long. You got a new microphone. I do. I'm very excited. I got an AKG mic uh, to replace my large diaphragm condenser with another large diaphragm condenser, and um, I'm sounding extra sexy. So that just makes yeah, me feel. You're so just good. a big fan of the large diaphragm. Mr. Larry <laughs> Pesci is here with us. Larry, welcome. Uh, it's good to be. It's good to be back. It's been again. Feels like a couple weeks and just craziness of life. But hey, we're back, and I've been having all sorts of fun with crazy projects. Oh, good, Mr. Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. Good evening. It's good to be here. We're having a lot of fun here, and uh, 
just enjoying the enjoying the weather out here. We've got nice balmy weather, about 85, 90 degrees. Nice. Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. I can't say I feel like it's been weeks. I feel like it's been hours. Yeah, maybe. I mean, last night we were doing a podcast together, too. So it's right about 24 right. hours, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's been about 24 hours. Man, look, I tell you, there's so much love to go around. That's it. <laughs> a lot of love. If you've got a specific guest or topic you want to see covered on one of our shows, submit your suggestions by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests. Complete that form. We review those submissions on a regular basis. Chad Anderson is here with us for this segment and has a particular interest in automation, network security, and their intersection. His primary focus leans heavily on leveraging open source technologies to improve deployments, network security, and systems administration at Domain Tools. To find out more about Domain Tools and the awesome set of products and tools, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash Domain Tools. Chad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Yeah, nice to have you, Chad. And you've uh, you've been doing some really uh, really awesome research uh, as part of your role uh, at Domain Tools. Uh, I guess since you're uh, the first time that we've had you on the show, to my knowledge, and sometimes I'm confused as to who's been on the show and who hasn't, so I apologize. <laughs> no, this is number one. Okay, number one for for yeah. Chad. Chad, how did you get your start in information security? Um, you know, uh, that's funny. I landed on an IRC server when I was a kid and, um, ran into this chat room of people that were just like internet delinquents. And then uh, it all went from there. It's funny. I, I still feel like you could call uh, my friends that do internet security, you know, security, uh, like internet delinquents, maybe. <laughs> that means the, yeah. the Twitter hackers are in good shape. I think it's a term of endearment, actually. <laughs> Like, I wouldn't have it any other way, <laughs> to be honest I, with I you. Think, I think it should be an interview question for for every uh, security firm, especially pen testing firms. And the, the, the more the – more, God, Jesus. The number one question <laughs> should be, do you like following the rules? Right. And if, if you say yes to that, you're, you're out of here. Out. <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> Instantly out. Uh, Chad, tell us a little bit about the research team uh, over at Domain Tools. You seem to be uh, expanding recently in the uh, in the areas of research. Yeah, we're doing a lot. So um, I have a uh, my compatriot Tark, who's been on on your mm -hmm. show before. Um, he does a, a most of our like malware research. Um, he's our senior malware researcher, and then I head up kind of like um, you know adversary infrastructure mapping and things like that. Um, other general stuff, and then we're kind of split um, in half with the data science team that does lots with, um, you know, determining uh, or kind of predicting maliciousness in domains. So um, that's kind of what we do in day in day out, and um, you know, a lot of just helping customers as well with uh, with their work, uh, kind of client services stuff. But uh, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. I'd imagine, uh, Chad, you've been pretty busy lately uh, with COVID-19, tracking some of the uh, scams and reopen campaigns. And if you could give us some insight as to, you know, what you've been tracking over the past few months. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, coronavirus, obviously, it exploded. Um, you know, at Domain Tools, we do a lot of uh, mapping the Internet every single day, multiple times. Um, and with coronavirus, we saw a spike of like 6,000 domains per day being registered with wow. COVID or coronavirus themes. A lot of those were lures for phishing campaigns and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, just to give like kind of a uh, a look at that, you know, people registering like malicious Office 365 domains per day, you know, there's maybe 30 to 40 a day. So 6,000 of a certain theme is like huge. Um, so we did a lot of hunting through that and we're able to find like a, a novel piece of ransomware that we did a write up on. Um, and then that kind of like slid into um, all the other things that started coming out, the reopen campaigns, hydroxychloroquine scams, um, all of that, just trying to keep up on tracking it. It's just, it was a deluge though, right? It's just so much stuff around coronavirus. Chad, in your I assessment, was, was there like a, a level of success? I mean, obviously you you really were living under a rock if you hadn't heard about coronavirus, COVID-19 uh, and, and things like that. But like, it, it, what is the success of some of these uh, campaigns? Um, pretty successful from what, from what we heard, people that, you know, um, that we spoke to that were actually dealing with incidents, um, the 
the kind of the start of just seeing how successful it was, was um, there was uh, a bunch of lures that were targeting um, folks in Japan that were on some sort of like government assistance program. Um, but it was really like the ones that were most successful like that were all just playing on fear. Like you're going to lose your government benefits because yeah. of the coronavirus. You know, you need to open this document and enable macros. Um, otherwise, you'll get coronavirus. Um, stuff <laughs> like that, you know, uh, so uh, that was uh, those were the most successful ones, certainly. Um, but and, and I think that whole like global fear is what really made it so successful for everybody um, that was, you know, trying to run some campaign through that. And uh, there was a ransomware campaign uh, thrown in there as well. A couple of them, probably. Yeah, well, there was a lot. So, uh, the, um, you know, Ryuk was targeting, the Rebel group was using uh, coronavirus lures, um, all of that. But we found an interesting um, piece of Android, like locker ransomware, um, just from like hunting through all these domains. I was I was like pulling all these screenshots uh, just to like see what pages look like because there was so much each day. I thought maybe I could just like look at these really quick and, and uh, be able to determine something based on that, you know, instead of like going through and... Um, you know, looking at on-page content and things, um, and was able to find uh, this site that looked, uh, uh, some guy had posted it on Reddit, um, his like developer site of a, of a coronavirus map. Um, and then this was a direct iframe clone of that with like download our Android app at the top. And um, we pulled that down and it ended up being, uh, yeah, a little locker ransomware app. And um, we, got the key out for that before like any money ever hit the Bitcoin wallet. So that was kind of nice. That was a nice win. I, I, I feel like the, it, how popular is that uh, mobile ransomware? Um, you know, I, I would have to lean on someone who's more, uh, you know, up on the mobile yeah. ransomware game. Um, I just don't really pay as much attention to mobile security as I probably should. I just like hope to, that my iOS device and that like secure enclave is good enough. Right, right. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. That's well. That's that's really interesting. We haven't talked about like Android-based specifically mobile ransomware. Yeah. Well, and typically, like with with Android ransomware, what I've heard, if you you know use an alternate store, if your device is rooted, like all things to worry about. Mm. But um, if you're if you're just downloading things from the Play Store, there's some malicious apps that make it through, but they usually get picked up pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. I was talking okay. to Brian Keim from Forrester earlier today, and he actually mentioned domain tools uh, in a lot of the work that you guys have been doing on the disinformation uh, campaigns and, and programs. Obviously, COVID's the hot topic now, but are we starting to see trends as we get closer to the election? Does that do, does some of that shift? W where where do we see some of the trends? I mean, is this COVID thing going to last for a while or, or do we see a shift in where some of these disinformation campaigns come from and do we see the, the kind of the attack shift? Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to watch how and build tooling to kind of see how the uh, disinformation campaigns kind of start with, you know, something on social media and then lead to like domains that are then leveraged for ransomware or whatever um, or to, you know, to push uh, uh, malware. But um, we're kind of seeing, like, in, in my view, or seeing a lot where there's, like, influencers like Donald Trump or whoever will tweet something like, you know, reopen or liberate or hydroxychloroquine, and we'll see, like, a burst of domains all around that um, that are registered. And so trying to track those things, uh, we're getting more toward the election cycle where that stuff's starting to happen. Um, and there was, a, like, a little... I don't know, blip of uh, some of the voting machine companies with like domains that were registered that looked like, uh, like, um, you know, clones of those or phishing pages for those. But uh, yeah, it's all starting to ramp up in that direction. Coronavirus still, still huge though, you know, real hot right now. Everyone's thinking about it. Yeah, I bet. Can, Un can you tell how long I wish it would just go away. Can you tell how long those domains stay registered? I wondered what the TTL on some of them was anymore. How long is mm, the around? Uh, hey, usually stuff gets picked up for, you know, a year um, just for some cheap domain sale. Um, they leverage it and then dump it. Um, some of the longer mm -hmm. form stuff, uh, it's always it's always surprising. You know, you come across like some C2 infrastructure that's been around for like six years. And you're like, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it, normally stuff's pretty short lived. Okay. And, and even the time of activity is way shorter, right? Um, it right, could be I'm hours to days. Well, I was that was my next question. What 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 was the activity time? Thanks. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chet, what are some of the other uh, disinformation campaigns that you've been researching? Um, you know, it's it's been just around anything that's that's hot in the news. We had, mm. you know, I'm here in Seattle, and we had the whole Chaz Chop um, yep. uh, thing go down, and and um, the Seattle protest hashtag there was really uh, interesting. Um, that was where I started writing some of the. Um, the kind of things to pull social media and Twitter and whatnot to then like pull down all these users, look at what they're writing, sentiment analysis on it, um, uh, pull out all the URLs and then try and spot like which ones, you know, users were pushing something malicious or weird or, um, you know, and just kind of using all that data to try and predict who was the, uh, who were the ones trying to be influencers. Um, but yeah, that, that's been a big one. Um, uh, the the whole protest thing um you know going around blm stuff has been huge for disinformation as well it's all kind of just tied together one long string of events right which means mail in ballots are next right yeah yeah hmm. we uh, and, uh maybe and we'll... beirut yeah yeah mm-hmm. and yeah i would not be surprised i haven't um with with uh virtual hacker summer camp um i've been watching talks all day but um that is something to look into. I guarantee you there's going to be um, some sort of lures to deal with Beirut or like, you know, donate money for Beirut, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Chad, when, when you look into some of these disinformation campaigns, um, uh, how do you do the infrastructure mapping and, and specifically how does it uh, kind of relate to uh, the domains, but also traversing across social media? Mm hmm. Um, so initially I'll just like crawl the social media through APIs. I, I use like a Jupyter notebook, um, mm-hmm. usually. And, uh, if, for, if anyone is not familiar, it's just like a, it's a web-based, uh, notebook with executable code in it. So you can put Python in there and kind of, um, you know, call out to all your regular APIs and munch the data. And then it's really easy to share out with people. So we well, that, share that's interesting chat. Here. So, uh, you can execute code from within a Jupyter notebook. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's like this um, there's this uh, background kernel for like Python or Lua, Scala, whatever you're running in the yeah. background. Um, and then you kind of write up some Markdown, write up a chunk of your code to explain it. Um, hit go. Things like Matplotlib will just drop uh, graphs like right into it. So if you're hmm. if you're building things that you want to execute later or kind of share in a community. Um, it's a great way to do it. Um, that's and that's, awesome. that's how we do a lot of our work. Um, yeah. So based on the domain information, then you're kind of using the APIs in social media networks to pull information and, and make correlations, draw graphs, and share that with other other analysts? Yep. And I'll, yeah, I'll pull out all the domains um, from, the, from there and then kind of run them through the domain tools data set. You know, we've mm-hmm. got 25 or 20 years of historical domain data. Um, you know, usually actionable intelligence, what, it's like six months, you know, Mm -hmm. but, um, we can still see a lot there. Like if they've hopped around between, um, uh, you know, multiple like ISPs or something, cause we catch all those IP changes and whatnot, or name server changes. Um, and then I'll go ahead and like also now pull all the certificates from say census, you know, um, just because, uh, I don't know about you, but whenever I set up a web server, like I initially run some, some test uh, and, do like an SSL certificate, right? And especially with Let's Encrypt now. Um, and sometimes I'll like, oops, I accidentally put like all the V hosts in there mm-hmm. um, or something along those lines. Uh, so a lot of the times when attackers are like setting up infrastructure that's malicious, you'll get more information from looking at those historical SSL certificates. That's the reason I do that. Um, but it kind of, it ties it to even more domains and, and those sorts of things. So um, all that kind of comes together and dumps out at the end of this long notebook and, um, or I'll load it into Elasticsearch and then just graphs to crawl over the data. And w- what are some of your favorite APIs to use for interfacing with social media networks? Um, so I use, so for Twitter, um, the big one is Twint. Um, for me, it, <laughs> yeah, speaking of violating the rules, it does violate Twitter's terms of service. Mm. Um, so I've never used it, but um, it yeah. does get all of the tweets you could um, you could you could want. Where the sometimes the Twitter API doesn't give you everything that you're looking for. So um, twi- it, twi- other... Twin is more based on scraping, whereas Tweepy actually requires a, an API key. 
Yeah, yeah. Twint is uh, Twint is really slow, but if you're yeah. trying to crawl all the tweets and like archive, it's it's the only way to go. Um, unfortunately, mm. I wish it was within their terms of service, but including block tweets. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, um, I you know you can actually pull. Let's see. Well, you can't get the block tweets, obviously, but I was trying to think of like if there's a place to go and uh, no, I'm just archiving like tweets from accounts just in case we get deleted. That's usually where mm. I'm, I'm going with that. Right. Yeah. And and do, do you use it in kind of like both directions? In other words, you're kind of scraping Twitter to look for domains and then start your investigation and then the other way, right? You've got a domain and you want to go search uh, Twitter for it. Absolutely. Yeah. And then looking around on like link shorteners or um, things like that, see if it's popped up anywhere, like on URL scan, you know, searches on URL scan are always great. You can go in like, um, uh, you can go through URL scans, like past 30 days history for free. Um, and, and usually there's someone who's already looked at it before. Um, and that kind of like that way you don't have to go and like actually scrape the site yourself, um, and reveal your, uh, location and whatnot. Always right. try to have decent ish opsec, but, uh, yeah, all, all those things back and forth. And, and domain tools preserve that, uh, screenshot for you as well. Right. Uh, it, yeah, is it historical? Yeah. Do you get different revisions of that screenshot? I'm trying to remember. Now. We we do we do, and we you know we currently don't do on page content. Um, uh, that's why like you know something like URL scan can be useful, mm -hmm. but uh, we hopefully will be in the in the near future, nearish future. Um, I would say. Mm. Yeah. What are some Super of the other? Useful. What are some of the other upcoming uh, research projects that you're looking on taking on, or the ones that you've started? Um, you know, the, this kind of whole social media and looking at trends and like trying to predict, uh, what the next big boom of things is going to be is, is really the long-term goal right now for, um, me and research. Um, so I, I don't really have anything else over the horizon yet that I can think of. Um, you know, I've got a couple ideas kicking around, I guess. Uh, but it, it kind of tying that whole, like everything with these information campaigns, it starts on social media, moves super quick, mm. um, is quickly like scraped and thrown away. But like it's trying to see how that influences real people instead of bots. And then they register domains and try and make, you know, whatever out of it. Um, just being able to detect all that is is uh, super important for us at this moment. If If I think about like how do you kind of predict where those next kind of leading trends are? I mean, they probably start on social media in some form or fashion. I was, I was joking about mail-in ballots, but look, it's yeah. all over the news headlines. Can you start to see, uh, like, you know, maybe it starts to trickle, but then you start to see that uptick, and then based on that, like, really start to look at where are potential malicious domains popping up that are trying to, you know, do something around that particular topic? Are, are, can you guys start to do some level of prediction of what that might, that next leading trend could be? Yeah, so, well, kind of the, the, the running theory that I'm working with and what I'm starting to see and hopefully can flesh more out is things start getting talked about on social media, right? So you'll see all this discussion about, say, mail-in balance. And then you'll see a boom in like Google Trends for searches that are like mail in ballots. And then a couple of days later, like domains start getting registered, like bandmailinballots.com or something, right? Um, and then going and looking at our current machine learning um, scores, which which predict based upon like proximity to bad infrastructure, age of domain, a um, bunch of other secret sauce. Um, but uh, you know, like tying that in, I can go and see like, okay, well this like, you know, ban mail and ballots.com, you know, it was registered on reg.ru and it's sitting on a server, like a Shinjuru server, which is like the Malaysian OVH. And uh, I, I go like, that's pretty fishy. Uh, so, uh, you know, like being able to predict like that domain is probably going to be bad based upon those factors. And you can see that from the genesis of like things being spoken about on Twitter up to that point. Right. Yeah, and that's what I meant, right? I mean, that's how you get it. You try to get ahead of this a little bit is you see those trends happening on social media, and then you see the domains registered, and now you're like, eh, probably should flag that domain. Yep, exactly. Yep. 
It, and then so, go ahead and look at the IP behind it, you know, and you find uh, for the past year they've been doing coronavirus lures and you know yeah. everything else. So it's it's all uh, it all ties together, you know. And no one likes to like rebuild out all their infrastructure too. I don't think there's there's very few um, malware authors that I've seen that have like full like CI/CD pipeline with Terraform that's like mm-hmm. establishing all this stuff for them so they can do a you know, and a whole new infrastructure for every campaign. Those people are super advanced. Most of it's really low hanging fruit stuff where they'll just reuse the same, you know, WordPress box that they pop somewhere over and over again. It, 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 can you pre register some of those domains if you see a trend? And I forget what really popular malware, and I should know the name of it, right? Where they were tr- trying to do that, right? Predict the algorithm and register the domains. I guess it's pretty common in any botnet or. Uh, type of malware to be able to do that can we do that to get ahead of of phishing domains um definitely i i i know that some people do for dgas you know they go and they register all those uh um it will once they like reverse the algorithm um or there's like another new one that's kind of fun that does uh um it's dogecoin like wallet i think it's the dookie malware or or dokey yeah i think we have a story (laughs) but yeah we have a story about that yeah yeah, yeah, it uh, it um, it, it's based upon you know transactions coming into a Dogecoin wallet that uh, then goes and registers the new C2 domain. That one's fun, but uh, yeah, you, you know, being able to look and see that, um, you know, potential for what people will get. Yeah, it's um, it, it would be a good preventative measure, certainly. Mm. How, how does... I would probably just think I'd want to sell those domains, right? Like maybe I could get an extra ten bucks on top right. of the regular. <laughs> there you go. Like, like hey, we got yeah, we get, we got ahead of the you know whatever the next news cycle is, and now I you know I've got them for sale, and you could sell them. That would be kind of yeah. That would be shady. I'll get them, and then I'll get them like real respectable looking, so they pass the machine learning score, and then I'll have a nice marketplace I can sell there them off on you know raid forums or somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, Chet, can you expand upon the, the domain tools uh, platform specifically for, you know, like security researchers and or those working for the enterprise? Like, what what, what are some of like the top benefits in your mind that uh, if I'm, I'm thinking about doing this kind of research and I want to use domain tools, like what's the benefit? Yeah, we so we have massive amounts of historical data um, to tie things together. And that, that gives you a lot of introspection. We kind of have this. Um, there's a panel called Iris. It's like our investigate tool. Um, and it brings in, you know, passive DNS, um, all of the like DNS SSL certificates, um, who is information, everything that we have ever observed about any domains. And we, with our methods, we, we get about over 99% of all like new domains as they come online. So if it exists, you'll see it in there. Um, and, and if it, you know, if, for some reason you're looking at something that doesn't exist in there, we'll probably find it in the next couple minutes. So it's, it's great like that. But um, so there's that whole investigate tool, which is fantastic. And then the other big benefit would be, we have this um, enrichment API that just ties into all sorts of things from Phantom, QRadar, Splunk, you know, uh, Elastic Sim, you name it. And anything that's coming across your logs is immediately enriched with all of our historical data. Um, and, and that's a real like killer for any sort of like SOC or IR team or anything like that. So those are, those are our two big ones. Um, and then couple that with, we have a whole like fish detection platform called mm-hmm. FishEye. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it kind of does, uh, the algorithms, like it does everything from like Unicode character matching to like bit flips to, um, all of that. Uh, you just put in a term and it'll tell you like if things have been registered, which, somehow fit like that data so if you you know if you're uh securityweekly.com throw it in there anything that is close like if someone does a cyrillic r you know for security oh i do um, I, I do know because up. we we use fish eye and i get those reports oh, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah it's uh th- those are the three like the the biggest things we have our classic tools too um I, I don't really dig into those much anymore um just because uh yeah i like the hot new stuff Research is more fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, research is fun. I, I'm, it's all about causing trouble, being an internet delinquent, um, and then using that to get paid. Uh, so uh, I, I was trying to think of the book that I read and what the worm was, and I had a mental blank, and I figured it out. It was Conficker, obviously. Uh, hmm. The book was Worm by Mark Bowden. And if you want to kind of see how important 
the domains and DNS infrastructure is and how it relates to malware, highly recommend that book. I don't know if you've read that book, Jeb, but it's awesome. I haven't. I actually just picked up, um, is it Sandworm? Is yeah, Sandworm's the, another the good one. one. Yeah. Yep, that's a good one. Yeah, too. I read fantastic. that fantastic. So well, re- it actually makes like security sexy to read about, which is yeah. a, which is a rare thing. <laughs> so, yeah, because it's like uh, international it like really conspiracies and spies all tied into yeah security. Yeah, yeah. no, that's great stuff. Um, uh, Godly. Well, yeah, so I was thinking about the the domain, uh, you know, similar domain stuff, and I mean, we you know look for changing wording stuff. Is it common for for somebody to register like a, a mydonain.com.uk or some other country, or is that just a little too obscure? Um, no, people do that. Um, yeah, there's if you can think of it, someone's someone's done it. Like there's a there's weird stuff where I've seen research where people like will purposefully register bit flip domains, which is like some sort of radiation caused a bit to flip, you know, and then yeah. it's like, like that's it. Um, or people have done research like where they can spot in passive DNS, like when there was a solar flare is like the, the theory, um, mm-hmm. just based upon like the anomalies and like recorded query and response data. So um, if you can think of it with domain names, somebody does it. Um, the the internet's a weird place, um, a weird, wonderful place. And and Chad, still uh, today, attackers are not anonymizing the registry, uh, the register information, right? Like hiding who they are or randomizing that or paying the extra money. I guess if you're trying to register thousands of domains per day, you know, that extra whatever, 10 bucks to, uh, you know, protect your information so you can't use that for correlation kind of uh, becomes cost prohibitive. Is that still true? Sort of, you know, it depends on the registrar if they're outside of like, uh, it, there's the whole GDPR thing, right? Where a lot of um, who is information is now kind of obfuscated um, for privacy reasons. Mm-hmm. But we've got, you know, there's there's so many different indicators that tie to a domain with, you know, certificates and, and yeah. um, you know, name servers and things that you can really still make a signature to spot somebody to where I think, people learn to rely on the who is information and it kind of made people lazy in their investigations. Like, Oh, I can just right click. It's like, it's, you know, Paul Asadori and, and right click, you know, and, uh, expand on all that. I can see all eight domains. Um, mm-hmm. so it, you know, it's, it there, it's more obfuscated, um, for most registries, but it's, it's not as important. I feel, um, to have, who is to go and hunt on things anymore. You know, there, there's so many other signatures you can pull together, especially with it. Something's always observed at some layer of the infrastructure um, where before, like people just lie about what their name is or their address anyways. Right. If right. they, if they really right. wanted to. So. Yeah. So you can pick up on those, uh, on those trends uh, w- without relying on the actual information that's stored in the registry. Cause at some point they're using those domains for a common goal and you can kind of do the investigation and draw those inferences. Yeah, like every everyone needs a IP that's going to be sitting out there. They're going to yeah. have to point their domain to a name server. Um, it, they're going to have a certificate at this point if they're you know trying to do anything through the browser. Yep. Um, you know, you can look at the DNS records. Like you know, they'll have some DKIM set up if they're sending uh, some phishing emails from there. Uh, there's just all these all these indicators that like are easier to make signatures on than. Like, oh, this domain's owned by Bob, you know? Yeah, and, and harder to uh, really hide inside of all that infrastructure, right? Because it kind of raised the bar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. More questions for Chad? Five questions for Chad. So, oh, yeah. so go ahead. Then. What, what, so, we, you know, what do you, what do you think is the next, um, I mean, you're talking about ways you're correlating. What do you think is the next way uh, they're going to leverage for hiding? What do you see coming? I mean, you figured out a lot of stuff. What's mm. next? Yeah, what is next for hiding? Uh, There's no wrong answer. Know? Yeah. It's great point. Um, it's funny. I, you know, I can't really, I can't really predict the future on that one. Um, okay. It's probably going to be something, something, you know, with ever whatever next technology. Um, you know, we release and no one's ready for, oh, you know what, let's go here. Um, Because I've been seeing this more and more lately as people, um, you know, 
breaking into uh, containerized infrastructure, you know, your Kubernetes, your Docker, whatever, um, and just kind of like launching a pod with, uh, you know, or a, a Docker container with Alpine Linux and curling down some tool. Um, and just all of that just looks like regular execution on the cluster, right? Um, and then they right. just kind of take over more and more of that infrastructure. Um, that's that's certainly a, a new spot just because, uh, you know, I, I'm coming from a DevOps and like sysadmin background, um, when I first got into the industry, like all that stuff was so fresh um, and st or, sorry, still is so fresh that a lot of people just don't know it yet. So if you see a pod run that's just like an Alpine Linux pod, you're like, that's probably fine. You know, as a developer doing something. Um, but really, that's just a, a new spot for someone to hide in people's infrastructure. And in a big cluster, you'll be hiding in the noise. They're, yeah, exactly. You're not going to stand out. Yeah, if you have a thousand like other Alpine Linux containers running in that cluster, or you know, even it, you know Debian, Ubuntu, whatever, um, you're you're no one's going to see you. Yeah, Alpine might actually stick out like a sore thumb since probably eighty to ninety percent of that's more Debian based than it is Alpine yeah, based. True. But <laughs> you never know. Yeah, true. It's maybe just me who tries to get my containers as small as possible, you know? Right, right. Um, I know most of, yeah, a lot of developers are just like, Ubuntu, run it, it works. So, you know, all the everything on Stack Overflow says it, so. <laughs> well, you know what? Oh, you, pro you I, program on Stack Overflow, too? Cool. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. It, whenever I get a ticket, I just, uh, I just copy and paste that Jira ticket directly into Stack Overflow and then copy the answers out. Mm. Um, that's, that's the whole job. It's actually a really good strategy. That, that yeah. is such an like amazing that. developer strategy, really. Mm. You just, you know, yeah. just bounce back and forth. you be fine. Maybe I can automate that and then just, like, have three or four jobs going at once. Um, get out of here. You'll be a great security champion in a DevSecOps program, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, Paul, we, we, we laugh about that now, but wasn't that, like, the story behind how Hack5 got their start? Like yeah, he, like he they were audit, yeah. government contractors, and they literally scripted themselves out of a job, and oh, they had all this free time, so they started a podcast. Yep, that is. There was story. also the guy who got a job at Amazon and then just proxied it to someone he hired um, in China, mm, um, yeah. and ended up getting cut <laughs> that way. But uh, you know, had made a good margin for not doing anything for a while. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that story. He outsourced his job, um, yeah. which I thought was kind of brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Just needed a webcam to see his RSA token, and that's all it needed. Yeah. Um. So, uh, Chad, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh yeah, let's do it. All righty, let's do it. Three words to describe yourself. Oh goodness me! Those are them. Those three. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Definitely Strangler. You've got to do the hands. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Mm. That's a pretty good title. Yeah, is that your answer? Yeah. Mm, a memoir. <laughs> mm, a memoir. <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Mm, second. Definitely second. you got to, uh, you, you know, yeah. You want to know, like, how hard to go afterward. In uh, in I already asked that question. <laughs> Choose two celebrities to be your parents, alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Oh man, <laughs> got it. Gosh. sorry. Um, let's go with uh, Tom Hanks and uh, Ben Affleck. Ooh, oh yeah, damn. definitely gonna do the two dad route. Love it, awesome. Chad. Thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. All right. Folks that want to learn more, make sure that you visit securityweekly.com forward slash domain tools. Chad, thank you again for appearing on the Thanks show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Stay tuned. Security news coming up next.